Hey, we're turning our attention to the boarding school stories. We've heard from the folks in Niagara. We'll be hearing from Pastor Donald in a little bit about what they've experienced up there. But I uh, want to start with Kenneth Adams, Chief Emeritus of the Upper Mattapani Tribe. The Upper Mattapani and Chickahominy have been very closely related through the years. And uh, Chief uh, Kenneth has what I think is one of the most powerful family stories about the ways that uh, boarding schools impacted Virginia. We did have one of the first boarding schools in America in Virginia. It was at the school of William and Mary, and it was a boarding school that no Indian sent any children to, practically. I think the, the largest number they ever had was 24. And um, it wasn't until the 1860s through the 1960s that we get to the age of assimilation, the modern era of boarding schools and forced removals. So uh, I, I want to welcome Chief Kenneth now. And uh, the last job that I had was executive director of the Virginia Tribal <coughs> Education Consortium, which is composed of seven tribes in Virginia. And we were working towards um, equity in education for Indian students in the Commonwealth. It means different things to different people. So what does it really mean, equity in education? Equity in education, as, as discussed by some people, is not critical race theory, even though from a historical perspective, critical race theory has been taught in Virginia for 400 years. Mm -hmm. And we're here to change that and provide education about Virginia Indians, which will be spread across the Commonwealth. There's no other, there's no other state in the Union where all the federally recognized tribes in the state have come together to work towards equity in education. But we're here now in Virginia, and I just resigned from that. Um, Kirk, back there, good friend of mine from years, um, his sister took my job, <laughs> <laughs> which is okay with me. <laughs> Okay. We're going to get there, folks. We're going to get there. And nobody's going to stop us. Amen. It's just not, they're, just, they're not going to stop us. We've come too far, for so, and, and it's taken us so many years to get to this point in Virginia. And there are people in the Commonwealth. And the government is saying we're not going to have critical race theory taught in Virginia schools, even though they've been teaching it for 400 years. So they were teaching it against the Indians and the African Americans and other minorities for years and years and years. But all of a sudden, now they don't want equity in education because the Indians want it and the black people want it. We're going to get it there. We're going to get there. We're going to make it happen. But anyway, I have a few things I want to share to you share with you today. <clears throat> Larry mentioned my family. And when we talk about boarding schools, my family experienced something that's unique. Because since we were not fairly recognized, we didn't go to the Indian boarding schools that everyone knows about. But many of us went to Bay Home College. My next to oldest sister spent a year with the Chickahominy people getting an education at the Chickahominy school that was here back in the late 1940s. So 
my folks asked some of the Chickahominy folks if my sister could stay with them while they while she attended school here. And my sister Nora, who is now living in Sacramento, attended here in the 1940s, late 1940s school, right with, this, with the Chickahominy folks. She was the first one that had to leave home, leave home to get an education. When I say Virginia's a little bit different, we didn't go to the broad uh, native boarding schools or Indian board schools or residential schools as some folks call them. We didn't go to any of those. We had to look for places outside of the state where we, where our family members could get a high school education because high school education was not available for the great majority of Virginian students, Virginia Indian students. It just wasn't available. So I know that the Chickahominy people started going to Bacon in the, in the mid 1940s, early to mid 1940s. My family came along right after that. So Nora, she leaves home, comes over here. It may as well have been 100 miles away because it was just, you know, Things were different back then. People didn't travel like as much as they do now. So, but she lived over here with a family and attended school. And then she went off to Bacon College, still in the late 40s. How many years ago was that? 70, 75, almost 75 years ago. My sister is still living, went to Bacon College in the late 1940s. Her daughter, her daughter, Chris, Christina, her daughter Christina Azakar, for those of you who don't know what Azakar means, it's sugar, Azakar, sugar. My sister Nora's daughter, Christina Azakar, well, first off, my sister married a, an Argentinian, Argentinian, I guess that's a good way to say it, guy from Argentina <laughs> and several children <laughs> and her daughter Christina Azagar went to uh, get her PhD in uh, Michigan many many years later and she became and this wouldn't have happened without my sister going away to college my niece became the president of the Native American Journalists Association just because of the consequences she became the president of NHA. So that's, that's a great part of what happened, a good part of what happened by my sister traveling to Bacon College. But let me tell you about my brother Wesley. I remember in my early years, that um, I remember my brother Wesley very, very briefly as he was at home. I remember one time I'm standing on a chair. My brother has a pail of water on the other chair, and he's take, giving me a bath as I stood on that chair when I was about this high. That's the last time I remember seeing my brother at home until I was about. 14 years old. He didn't come home during the summer. He was at Bacon College. He didn't come home during the summer because he had to earn money to go back in the fall. So part of that was serving in the National Guard in Oklahoma. So when my brother went to Bacon College in 1952, I was about five years old. I can't remember him being at home except for that one time. So, because we didn't have high school and college here in Virginia for Indian kids, they had to get it elsewhere. And so my brother in Oklahoma, a thousand miles away from home, 15 years old, going to high school for three years. Now he tells me later on in life, that he had to repeat the ninth grade when he went to Bacon, even though he had studied the ninth grade in Virginia. Why was that? 
my brother and three other kids in 1950 to 51, or maybe 52. Went to school in a woodshed. The woodshed, which was set up to have wood for the wood stoves in the old Sharon Indian School. My brother went to school in a woodshed because education was not available to Indians in Virginia except stuff that they were able to do on their own. Because the state and the county did not provide it. Very little. So my brother goes to Bacon College. I barely saw my brother, barely saw my brother for the next 10 years. He didn't grow up with his family. Not in his teen years anyway, he was gone, going off to school. He told me he worked every single day of his life while he was at Bacon, trying to get that education. So I go into Air Force when I'm 18 years old. After I graduated from high school in King William County, I can get to that, but I was just, just a word of the check mark. I was, um, I was the first, along with one other Native student, to graduate from a public high school in King William County. I was the first one. You're looking at history here with that. And, and, and it wasn't a good year, it wasn't a fun year, because there was a lot of flack from those other students that were there. So uh, I was the first one to graduate, along with one other, from King William High School, from a high school in King William County. And then I went into the service. I had probably seen my brother maybe two times over the, over the previous years, because when he left Bacon, he went into the Army. When I went to visit my brother in 1968, somewhere in Georgia, I think it was Fort Benning, Georgia, I went to visit him in 1968. It was like walking into the house of a stranger. My brother, who should have been home getting an education, was gone for all those years. He missed growing up with his family. And his family missed growing up with him to this day. I'm going to tell you a couple other stories. Most of you are familiar with Billy Mills. Billy Mills was the only American Indian to win the 10,000 meter run in the Olympics ever. The There's been none other. He was the only one. It happened in 1964. John Edwards, who was a good old friend of mine who's long gone now, he introduced me to Billy Mills and Steve Atkins back there at an event at a community college in northern Oklahoma or southern, southern Kansas, one or the other. We were introduced to Billy Mills by uh, John Edwards. John Edwards told me about his life. He said, when I was a young boy, I was uh, stolen from my home. When I was a young boy, he says, I was stolen from my home and sent off to a boarding school in Missouri, where I stayed until I finished high school. John Edwards was one of the few people back in that era that went on to get a PhD, but he told me the only reason that he did that was because he couldn't think of anything else except for studying because of his life in the boarding school. And John Edwards told me personally, he said, 
When I became a young man, I was one of the most angriest in the country. He said, my whole psyche was full of anger because of the boarding school that he attended in Missouri. I met some friends of John Edwards later on, and they all told me, John Edwards, if he was playing football, and he was on the offense on the opposing team, don't try to stop him, because he was one of the meanest people on the planet. And he said that to me too. He said I was one of the meanest people on the planet. That was because of the boarding school, his experience in the boarding school. That's another story by John Edwards, which is a pretty good story, actually. John Edwards, at an unsanctioned meet, he was a, he was a runner, John Edwards, at an unsanctioned meet, tied the world record in the 60-yard dash back in the 1960s. John Edwards. Billy Mills knew all about that. Billy Mills said it was very unfortunate that it was an unsanctioned meet. And John Edwards told me, he said, there was only one man alive that could run that faster than I could, and he was playing for the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Many of you have probably heard of him if you look back in some of those old films. John Edwards. John Edwards told me that when he returned home years later after working away from home, going to that boarding school, he said, I told my father I was going to build a steel whiskey. He was going to make whiskey. He said, I told my father I was going to make whiskey. And my father said, son, don't do that. He said, so I went to the back of my pickup truck and I took the tarp and flipped it back. And that was the most beautiful stainless steel thing that he could ever imagine. <laughs> <laughs> father said, go ahead. <laughs> anyway, but John Edwards also told me that there were two people in town that didn't want him to build a steel, and they were lawyers. And so he said, I'm going to kill those guys. John Edwards. He said, I had it all mapped out. I was going to kill those guys. That's from this boarding school psyche, anger, hatred. And then, one time later on, that wasn't long after that, he said, I was laying in bed, two or three o'clock in the morning, I jumped up out of the bed, woke up, sat on the side of the bed, just jumped up. He said, the word came to me. He said, you're not going to build a still, you're going to build a church. I went to that church. It's in Chickasha, Oklahoma. John Edwards. Meanest man on the planet built a church in Chickasha, Oklahoma. Mm. Still there. Some of you have met Sakina. I remember Sakina telling me about his time when he was taken from his home when he was this high. Sakina was from Alaska. He was sent off to Minnesota. He lived with a family in Minnesota. And what Sakina said was they refused to allow him to say his own name. And they called him Fred. <laughs> he said, I would stand on a chair in the bathroom, looking at the mirror, standing on a chair, looking at the mirror, repeating his own name time and time again. Couldn't even say his own name. This, this stuff was bad, folks. It was bad. So when my brother Wesley went for five years to Bacon College, of course he was separated from his family. He went to Bacon College. Bacon is definitely a boarding school, but it's not the type that the BIA runs. It was run by the Baptist Church, the American Baptist Church. Total different story. He didn't have a bad time at Bacon. 
because it wasn't one of those boarding schools that were well well understand. So there my my sister Nora, she's gone off. Here comes my brother Wesley, he's gone off. Then around 53 or 54, in order to get education for Howard, for Emily, they had to go live with families in Michigan to go to go to high school. They couldn't go to school in Virginia. No place for them to go to get a high school education. They went off to Michigan. Emily didn't have a very difficult time up there, even though everyone knew she wanted to be home. How it had a difficult time. How we won't talk about it very much. So when he was uh, able to, he decided to run off himself and he somehow wangled to get into the Marines at an earlier age than normal. But that's what he did. He ran off and joined the Marines. He told me that they treated him like a slave. The family he lived with. So, my sister Nora, my brother Wesley, my brother Howard, and then my sister Emily, who also went to Michigan. And then Mich ba Emily went for one year, for one year to Bacon College, came back to Virginia, and within a year she was married. And I asked Emily, I said, Emily, why didn't you go back? And she says, I was tired of being poor. I mean, of course, my family, my father and mother couldn't support them while they were away, so they had to take care of themselves, even at 15 years old. There is a school up in the uh, southwestern part of Virginia, which is known as a major recruiting ground for the NBA. Kevin Garnett, who's one of the best players in the NBA, went to that school. It's called Oak Hill Academy. It's a boarding school. Established by the Baptist Church. Because my sisters, like Sally and Louise, my sisters like Sally and Louise, who couldn't finish school in King William County, were sent off to this Christian boarding school in Southwest Virginia. My sister Louise told me, as mentioned, that when she was getting ready to go, she was scared to death. Never been away from home before for an extended time. But in order to finish high school, she had to go. Where else could she go? It was a Christian boarding school. Not the same type that you're familiar with that Pope Francis was talking about. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, it was a boarding school. They had to go to get an education. So I've had, it was 10 of us total. I'm number eight. Seven of the, seven of the 10 never finished school at home. I was the first one, 1965. It was a difficult time for all of us. It was a difficult time for the Indians in Virginia. Now, they don't want to talk, want us to talk about it in their school system. Not like they, not like we wish to talk about it ourselves. Nevertheless, like I said, we're not going to quit. We're going to continue down the right road. I know that most of you have heard about the event with uh, Pope Francis. And I saw that 
And I was really, really pleased that he asked for forgiveness. I don't think he went far enough, though. Amen. He should have refuted the doctrine of discovery. He should have refuted it when he had the chance. But he didn't do it. Now, when is it going to happen that the church refutes the doctrine of discovery? One of the problems with Indian communities in America today, in my opinion, is that the percentage of people on, in many of these computers, in these communities, who follow Christ, 10%, 5%, not like here in Virginia when it's probably 60, 70%, but the rest of the country, there's not too many Indians that follow Christ. We're hoping to change that. Amen. It's going to take a lot of work. Mm -hmm. It is my opinion that the white man can't do it. Mm -hmm. It's time for the Indians to do it. Come on. Ooh. It has to happen. It should happen. We're going to take those difficult experiences from the past. You know, and we're going to mold those experiences into promise. Into promise. For the rest of the natives in this country. Yes. And we're going to somehow get the gospel to them in the right way. Mm. When we were, when Jonathan Miracle was talking about uh, being booted out of tribal communities because you can't play that drum in this church, that, 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 that mantra, you can't do that here, is all across the country. Yeah. You know, I've had experiences in my church yeah. when someone comes in, a native comes in and does a song and dances a little bit, and then somebody says, well, you can't dance in this church. I'm serious. I'm serious. That's the way it happens. I remember when I was in, at Bacon College, there was a conference on Native American spirituality, and there was a young student there at that conference, and there was a discussion on exactly that subject. And this young student says, well, why don't y'all just get over it? Well, there was a Korean person in the front, in the, in the room, Korean minister, pastor. He said, I want to answer that. He said, if it was your grandmother, go ahead, Kenny. Mm -hmm. Would you get over it? Lord, help it. In 1960, there were 226 BIA-run schools in the, unit, in the United States. 226. In 1970, 60,000 Native students were in these board schools. 1970, 60,000 Native students were taken from their homes and put in boarding schools.
was one other thing I wanted to say, and I can't remember what it was. Something's got to give here, though, because uh, so many of those kids are still living. So many of them are still living, and they're suffering. They really are. Suffering a lot. Okay, let's, let's shift towards Hampton a little bit, because Hampton was established in, Hampton University was established in 1868 to educate African Americans who were just no longer slaves anymore. And about 10 years ago, 10 years later, that same school allowed Indian students to come. But where did you get the Indian students? Initially, those Indian students came from Fort Marion in Augustine, Florida. POWs. POWs. In Fort Marion in Georgia, in, uh, in uh, uh, Florida. And they went to boarding school here in Hampton. They went to Hampton to go to school. So this school that had been established in, 16, in uh, 1868 for African Americans, now it was a, student, a place also for Indian students to go to. And if you look at some of those pictures, you can see the unhappiness in their eyes. There's something else that happened at, uh, while some of these kids were at Hampton. There were quite a few of them that died. There's a cemetery on the campus with those students, those students that died. More troubling than that is the fact that they had children who died also. And they're buried there too. Children of the children are buried on the campus at Hampton U right now. There's not just a few. That's right here in the Commonwealth. I wonder if we I wonder if how that would go over if we were to preach that in the classrooms. I wonder if the state would say, hey, no, that's CRT. You can't teach that here. You can't teach the truth. They don't want us to teach the truth, but we're going to teach the truth. That's just the way it's going to be. Virginia was the first colony established by the English. And what happened in Virginia? from 1607 to 1707, transferred itself from this coast to the, the rest of the country. And in one century, 90% of the Indian population in this state was gone. Within one century after the settlers arrived, and then 300 years after the settlers arrived, that same percentage carried through across the nation 90% of the entire indigenous population was gone in 1900 by 1900. Gone. Do you hear anyone ever teach that in a classroom? Have you ever heard it at all in a classroom? I haven't. They don't want us to talk about that. They say we're, 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 we're putting the blame on people who shouldn't have the blame. Well, who's supposed to have the blame? <laughs> Somebody's got to have it, right? <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for listening to me. I pre appreciate it. Uh, Anthony, yes. Did you talk about your, uh, I think if your uncle went to leave here, go to school, and ended the service, and gave that sacrifice, <coughs> his name still not on that wall. Oh, oh yes, I'll tell you about that. I'll tell you about that. I had two relatives who passed away during the wars. One of them was in World War II. 
His name was Kenneth Tubbins. My name was Kenneth. I'm named after him. He died in 40s and 45. 44 and 45, I was born in 47. So I was named after him. He's my first cousin. In 1967, I had another cousin who was shot down in a helicopter in Vietnam, didn't survive. Now the reason, one of the reasons that I approached the Virginia War Memorial about these two particular people, these two particular people, one in World War II and one in Vietnam, their names are not on the wall with these thousands of other people. Of course, they weren't Virginians because they were forced from Virginia to live elsewhere because they couldn't find a decent job or get a decent education. So their families went elsewhere. So I have petitioned the War Memorial to please put their names on that wall. They might not have been Virginia citizens, but they're Virginia Indian citizens. Okay. Woo! Put them on the wall. I'm on the wall. Hi, my doctor. I'm a Yakub Ahimacho, Chahia Sands Art. I'm a great great grandson of the keeper of the pipe of my grandson, the Dakota Lakota, the Dakota, the Shamanic Nations. Um, where to begin? 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 I didn't have too much expectation to accept for prayer. I just want to say humbly, I come from a place of love and prayer. And now I, I you know, my friend Murray always tells me, you know, you know, why you don't have a job? Why you don't do this and do that? All this craziness, you know? And I refuse. I have an issue with that. Um, it's hard for me. When I grew up, all I had was a horse, a skunk, and my grandmother. My grandmother put me on a horse, so I'm trying to see I knew the horse will go on the trail and come back. Take me off the horse, feed me lunch, put me back to the horse, and the horse will take off a different trail, come back when the sun goes up. Then she'll take me off the horse, feed me, and put me to bed. That's how I remember. Speaking of Kota, hearing songs of our language, my dad spoke 17 different languages. German, Italian, Ojibwe, Dakota, Cree, Pro, Pawnee. He was a really amazing guy. He, I was his firstborn son. When I was born, I was not meant to be here, not meant to stay alive. I had three holes in my heart when I was born. Three preachers came and prayed over me. I came back to life. I still have visions of that day. I tell my mother all the time that I see her. She's in a facility right now. Fortunately, my siblings don't see her otherwise, but that's okay. I love them too, either way. But my mother. I asked my mother one time, I said, no, Mom, was you sitting in the chair praying over me with these preachers, watching cartoons? She goes, he wasn't even, she said, he was just a baby by the pond, you know this. I said, well, God, Creator, show me this to make that connection. I remember, it's so only me creature in that such way. That's how you go that way. So, one day, they come pick me up. Time to go somewhere. I travel around different places with my mother and mother. And one day, uh, they said, we're gonna take you someplace, we're gonna <coughs> feed you. We're gonna, get, we're gonna go eat somewhere. I thought they were gonna take me to like a powwow or a giveaway or a funeral or something. That's the only time to get to eat, you know? Somebody passes away, there's food there, you know? Well, instead, I was greeted with the other bunch of kids. My first time I ever seen an African-American guy, a black guy. 
I never knew so many white people. I didn't know anybody of personal color. I didn't understand English that very well. Um, I went to the bathroom. I came out, and mom and dad was gone. I didn't see my parents for about seven years afterwards. Four years later, I could not uh, speak my language. I couldn't dance. I couldn't <coughs> sing. I got whipped. I got hit with my hands. And I was spent a lot of time with the preacher. You know, I go to St. Joseph's Union School and I tell them what happened there, but they didn't care. They didn't believe me. I went to the local police, the police department outside Chamberlain, same thing. You belong over there. Who cares? I was so beat up. All I could do was cry. And I was to the point, I said, you know what? Who's, who's, who's going to save me? Crying for my mom and dad, but nobody was there. Um, the preacher used to spend a lot of time underneath the church. There's a passageway underneath the tunnel there. There's no soul there between the, where you go to the boarding place to go to, to sleep with all the other kids. And the kids would talk about that. You know, don't go to that preacher, don't go there because they ask you to, you're going to either end up dead or you're going to do something, something's going to happen. I didn't realize that, what they were talking about, until it happened to me. One day they were having a they're having a uh, a gathering outside. I come to custom to have three meals a day, fix my bed, go to school, learn this English, understand how to do essays and stuff like that. Uh, I start to read. And that was my only escape, was reading books. Um, at that time. And one day I was outside playing and then I'd seen somebody right next to me look like me. And uh, I said, who's your mom? I said, my mom, surely. Who's your dad? Dad's uh, dad will fiddle. I said, oh, that's my dad. That's my mom. Hey, we're brothers. There's my little brother, Derek. I didn't, I didn't know I was only, I, didn't, I thought I was by myself. Because of the age, you had to be separate places. Different times you get outside and all this stuff, you know. You had to go to church every Sunday. When they told me you had to be holy to go to church, I thought you had to be, I cut my, myself up, I don't understand a tie or shirt, or like I just had to cut it up, you know. Because God is all around us. We don't have to have a building to go and pray, go to the river and pray. Uh, I miss my skunk, you know. <laughs> My grandmother used to put me in red uh, tub all the time. I don't stand up, but I, I guess I, I, later in the after you realized that was just tomato juice. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm, I'm very cautious about my smell. My <laughs> I don't know if you see when I first came to the door, and I was like, you know, I'm like, trying to smell myself. You know? Wait, wait, is that shirt white? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter, I have a child now. She does the same thing, just a conscious thing. Uh, then one day, they are doing reconstruction to, to St. Joseph Indian School. I see a lot of stuff, a lot of kids missing, go missing on the river there. It's right next to the reserve river there. Now there's a thing called the Dignity Statue right above the Chibu in South Dakota. A lot of people go there. There was a spider by one, one of my friends that had all these different type of issues. He was supposed to live after five years old, but she stayed alive until about 28 or something like that. And it's in honor of her. So every time I see that, it's from, to me, that's a very special place. I see her. I don't see that statue of dignity. I, I see her because that was, she was the model for that. She will hold her star probe. Before she passed on, that's what she went to honor the, the sculpture and met the family the clean wars to accommodate that. So, but at the same time, I didn't realize all these Indian chiefs on this used to be school, and now it's a museum that these different chiefs on there. When I was younger, I was running to a buffalo. I said, Why is this white buffalo coming to me for? Why? Why? 
why is the cross coming to me? Why is the white buffalo coming to me? What, what's going on? I didn't get it. I pleaded with the, with the, the close relationship I had with the preacher not to let me go, to leave St. Joseph Indian School. First, at first, I was running away from it. I didn't I could, I was trying to escape. I took a lot of food from the pantry and fed the local natives around it. Four tops in the lower pool area. I used to take bags of food and just give it to them and drop it on them. It was a thing, you know, but those boys got to do that. And until they finally caught us one time because they said, what, we just went to the store and filled it up with, with food. Next day, there's no food in it. What happened to it? And that spore would be kind of laid down in, a, in bed, you know, kind of tired. Here they locked the doors up and everything that we couldn't feed our, our, our relatives. But I mean to ask the preacher not to take, let us go. He says, no, everybody's got to go home. I don't know where your families are, but you're going to have to go. I never see my parents, my father, nobody come and check on us. So I thought nobody would care. Um, but I knew that was going to be different. Life was going to be different. I had to get this routine, cleaning, make sure my bed is fixed. I pray in the morning, fix the bed, take a shower, get brush my teeth and everything, get ready for the day. Well, reality kicked in. Went to deliver upon my parents. My parents were in Rapid City, South Dakota. We went back, and for about maybe, I should say, six months, the life of Native people in modern society does not work. There's no help, no job, no money, no nothing. The tribes don't care about you. Our people back home don't care. They're still in that concept kill the Indian, save the man. A lot of people don't under, seem to comprehend that, even though that our people kind of consist of what seems something we do, come band together to accommodate. But that, again, we want to do that if there's a camera in front of us. I'll stand with you. But I stand with you in my heart. My people back home are not educated in that such way, don't seem to care, don't care, or whatever. So, me and my brother used to. Get up every morning and do it the same thing. But we didn't say Joe was waiting for the time to come back in September. September came. We didn't go back. We had to go find help, food. So I joined the local YMCA, boys club, church. And, and if I look at the newspaper, because I knew how to read at the time, who died? You know? I hate, I don't know sad to say, but I was either looking for who or died or who's getting married, one of the two, and I just go trying to find a location and get food and then sneak out, you know? Um, I was hungry. But today, it's a different story. I come with love, prayer. So with that, thank you for your time to listen to my story. If you've got any questions, you can ask me later. And that's such a way as an advocate of education, as the people of our history. That's what I do in both schools with the song and prayer. What will it come to my documents? Well, I want to thank you all for the opportunity uh, to be here today to share with you. Gentlemen, thank you for such a beautiful story, but yet such a difficult story to tell. Uh, the way that you told it was beautiful, and at the same time heartbreaking for so many. And, and what we've heard in the past and to hear it firsthand from one of the residential school boarding school experience uh, individuals. So hearing it firsthand, it, it touches your heart. Also, thank you, Dr. Ken Adams, for uh, sharing with us as well. Uh, so I'll be brief today. I don't want to share an awful lot of information, but I do want to uh, just share this a little bit. Um, from our region of the country, I guess you would say, in our little corner of the world at Tuscarora, uh, my name is Donald Robinson, I'm pastor of the Tuscarora Indian Mission. Tuscarora is one of the six nations of Haudenosaunee, uh, and we are located near Niagara Falls in New York, is where our reserve is. There are some Tuscaroras up in six nations in Canada, the Bradford area. Uh, of course, that's where the Mush Hole was, and where the, uh, uh, the Mohawk Institute, as they called it. And so I have a few first-hand experience uh, stories. I, I won't be able to share them with you today, of relatives and friends that, have, that went to that school as well, but I also have a lot of stories that I could share with you if we had time. Uh, regarding those in our church that passed away that were survivors of Thomas Indian School, Quaker School, and also my grandfather, 
with the Carlisle. He did play football with Jim Thorpe. Um, there's a picture in the Hall of Fame of them together there for the Ooring Indians. Very proud of uh, that heritage as well. Uh, but Carlisle, of course, was a school, was one of the boarding schools for a vocational school where my grandfather learned to become a carpenter, which was his trade. So I wanted to share that with you just briefly as I begin, but let me read to you uh, something I'd like to share. Rather than try to explain the orange shirt myself, I'll just read it. It'll be a lot quicker and shorter uh, for brevity. Uh, why an orange shirt? Uh, because former residential school student Phyllis Jack Webstad uh, shared her story of her first day at a residential school where her new orange shirt that she had gotten bought by her grandmother was taken from her as she was a six-year-old girl. This act left Phyllis feeling invisible and worthless and affected the way she lived for much of her life. September 30th is, an annually, is annually recognized as the Orange Shirt Day, highlighting the damage the residential school system did to the well-being of indigenous, indigenous children. Equally, it serves as a healing journey for the survivors and commitment by all who wear an orange shirt uh, that every child matters. Chief Fred Robbins, a former student of St. Joseph's Mission Residential School in William Lake, British Columbia, started Orange Shirt Day uh, to ensure that residential school survivors are not forgotten. Though through his vision, Chief Robbins brought together First Nations tribal councils, local government leaders, school districts, and former students to remember, recover, and reconcile. Chief Robbins, and Chief, Chief Robbins was recognized as a, a British Columbia Achievement a Community Awardee. Uh, in 2017 for giving voice and hope to reconciliation in British Columbia. Orange Shirt Day can be heard hard for those who survive residential schools and for their families. There's over 150,000 indigenous children attended residential schools in Canada from the late 1800s until the last one closed in the 1990s. And of those attending, it's estimated that over 5,000 of them died while under residential school care. Many survivors are still dealing with the trauma of abuse experience at these schools and the impact is not um, has not had adjusted well on them but for their families also now is the time to listen to their stories uh, the survivors the families and to learn from them so that these mistakes are not repeated it is a time for conversations about understanding the survivors truths and the beginning of the journey toward reconciliation now is the time for exploration of opportunities uh, to do better for generations of children to come. Uh, we can join that movement every time we wear the orange shirt. Uh, we're thankful for that uh, today as I want to remember that uh, and explain that to you. If you haven't already seen it, I'm sure many of you have already know exactly what it stands for. Uh, it, the first time I heard about the, the orange shirt movement was through a, an annual walk they do near Toronto. Now, I'm, I, I, Brother John Miracle there, he's from closer to Toronto on the north side of Lake Ontario. We're near Toronto from the south side of Ontario. Well, quite often we'll fly out of there. Uh, it's a bigger airport than, than Buffalo, where I'm from. It's much smaller. Uh, but I was, uh, I don't know if I was, I saw it on my phone. On, you know, they give you alerts and they give you uh, articles, or if I just read it myself on paper. But it was the story of Joseph Commanda. And he was a young boy who went to the Mohawk Institute, also known as the Mush Hole. Uh, and he and his brother decided to escape. And they were trying to make it back. Uh, through Toronto, getting back home. And they tried to jump a train, and Rocky, the older brother, was caught, but Joseph died falling from the train, I believe. Uh, he was only 13 years old. That happened in 1968. And um, August 27th of last year was when I had heard about, uh, well, I had heard about it earlier, but they, that was when they had the, the annual walk that takes a three day walk for his, the journey that he had taken from the Mohawk Institute to Toronto, where he had, he had perished. And so, while that was the first time I had heard of that, I wondered why it took so many years for uh, someone who's a pastor, someone who's, I travel the country, uh, like others, we've heard their stories, uh, and, and we have that information before us, but sometimes we, we don't process it, we don't sift through it, we don't realize what we're hearing when we hear a story like as Delman shared, and, and as uh, uh, Brother Adams has also shared with us today as well, in such compelling, uh, profound ways uh, that words really can't, adequately, at least my words, uh, I can't articulate what I'd like to, the feelings that I have inside when I hear those stories. So the stories that we've just heard and read about and the, the stories that are behind the orange shirt and uh, that many people would like to deny and, and say or, or minimize or marginalize, uh, those stories need to be heard 
they need to be told. And we're beginning that process, uh, even at this late date, so often that uh, while there may be 5,000 or maybe even 10,000 graves more to find, um, some of them unmarked, never known to the families what happened to their children, some of them well known. And, uh, we've got the chance to hear some of their stories. Let me just briefly tell you a little bit about uh, our church, what we're doing at the Tuscarora Reservation in our area and what, uh, what we're, our experiences may be in a small way, but yet we'd like to make it in a bigger way. And that is to say that this, this opportunity we have, this is really the second meeting. In New York, you may have uh, had the opportunity to, to see. And Larry, if you could somehow bring that up on the, 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 the uh, I guess we'll call it a debriefing uh, YouTube video. That would be awesome if we could put that up on the screen sometime today for everyone to see. And so you'll get a little bit of a visual of what I'm trying to explain to you. That we started in New York, uh, Western New York, near Niagara Falls area in our reservation in Tuscarora a few weeks ago, and it continues here this weekend at Chickahominy. And so while I'm very thankful for the opportunity to be here today and, and for all the, the invites and for that opportunity to share at both ends in this dual uh, meeting, it's really just scratching the surface and maybe even just beginning something beyond, bigger than ourselves, of what may happen. But here's what uh, we, we did. We took this opportunity for this initiative uh, while the, the, all the folks from Virginia, Pastor Larry and others, uh, Troy, of course, was there with us too, and, and Jonathan Sang. Uh, it was really an awesome time. We, had, we set up a booth at our annual powwow, our annual national picnic, as we call it. And we wanted to find out and get uh, some information from the community about how they would feel about our Tuscarora Indian Mission, one of three churches on our reservation, starting uh, sponsoring uh, this initiative to have a memorial place for the survivors who have now passed away on our reservation, and of course for those who passed away at the schools. And so while we had a chart up to hear their stories and, and post their names of those loved ones that have already gone home, we still have several uh, survivors at our church, but most of them have already gone home to be with the Lord. And, and so I've done many funerals as pastor at the Tuscarora Mission, and many of them have been for survivors uh, that, that went through that experience. And I wish I had some time to share some of their stories with you. Uh, stories like that one's always hungry and never having enough food to eat. And of course, uh, we have a, my cousin at our church uh, on that YouTube video, uh, Larry has posted, uh, was uh, uh, Cheryl Hill, who's written a book now about her mother's experience by Aunt Hazel at the Mosh Hall again, and at the Mohawk Institute, and how they would grow a garden full of food, uh, beautiful food, but never got any of it themselves. And the reason they call it the Mosh Hall, by the way, is because they got all the mush they wanted. Uh, I had a pastor who died last year, not from COVID, but during COVID, and so we couldn't have a proper burial and funeral for him, or even a memorial service. Uh, but he went to the Mosh Hall, and his experience for him mostly was good, because he loved mush. <laughs> but, but really, he, he had some friendships and some sports and things that he got the opportunity to do. And as I mentioned about my own grandfather, who got a vocation and, and got the chance to play football and, and many other things, it was still a difficult experience. And of course, that's for those who weren't raped and abused, those who weren't, didn't die there. And from this experience at our, our uh, annual picnic this year, um, one of the stories I heard, and there were several, more than, more than just a couple of them, and it was a story I had never heard before of one of the residents of our reservation. He had a sister I didn't know, and I got to meet his sister who came to our booth and explained to me that she had a, a grandmother who uh, sent four of her, or six of her uncles uh, to, uh, I, believe, I believe it was at, at the Mohawk Institute, but that whatever uh, residential school it was, uh, in fact, it may have been up near Akwesasne because that's where she's from. So I'm going to say it was, it was not a hole, but, but a school up, in, up north, further up north. And what she explained to me was that uh, her, her mother, her grandmother, wanted to go see her, her six sons that were in, in the boarding school. And so she saved many months for a bus ticket. She finally was able to go. And by the time she got there, two of her sons had already died. And I just thought, how does that happen? We're under a school, of all places, where we send our, our children for safety. Uh, that we could lose to them. Before all of them departed the uh, school, the same school, two more of them had passed away. So four out of six of her sons, this woman who was explaining to me about her uncles, it's a second hand story, four of the six that never came home. And so that's just one story of many. We all have people in our lives. We have many stories that need to be told. We have many uh, stories that uh, have been told but not really heard. 
and maybe because we don't want to share uh, stories of ugliness, stories of, of difficulties, and stories that, uh, that break our hearts. Uh, one last thing I would like to add before I kind of round this out today, and I, and I know there's a lot going on. We, we from that uh, time at our booth, we, we want to start this memorial and first gather information. We don't want to assume that our church, of all places, a Christian church, should be part of sponsoring a memorial. No one has been against it, and all have said we would like you to do it. And that's our first step, and I pray that it would be the, the first step in a, in a lot of steps, finding artists to give us the best memorial we can produce for our, our nation, uh, finding people who can you know, uh, bring the, the resources to make it happen, and, and ultimately a place and, uh, are doing it the right path and coming to our people and saying we're sorry at the same time even though maybe our, our particular church didn't have a boarding school and didn't have much to do with it. Part of that experience is saying, I'm sorry for what you went through. In Canada, I do believe we have a, a in September, I think it was Canadian Pacific. I, I keep saying Canadian National because that's the one in Toronto. But I think it's a Canadian Pacific train that they have on the side of the orange train. Every child matters. Uh, my wife and I couldn't see from Indian Hill, which is on the Tuscarora Reservation, the CN Tower, we can look across Lake Ontario. The curve of the Earth is only 15 miles, we'll go up on a ridge, we can see 32 miles to Toronto. <laughs> and so we tried to see from Indian Hill on, on the last uh, Saturday, I think it was in, in September, the commemoration and honoring Every Child Matters, the CN Tower lit up in orange. And we were able to see it from Art Park in Lewiston, New York, where we could see clearly across the lake with a good set of binoculars. And there it was, the CN Tower was lit up in orange, honoring our residential school students that had passed away and never made it home. And so while we have those small steps that the Canadian government, which I feel is very much ahead of our American government, mm -hmm. in recognizing the need for these stories to be told, uh, you know, I want to end with this little thought that I have a fellow I work with, I'm good friends with him, we're both tradesmen, he's an electrician, so am I. And uh, we work together and he said, well, you know, I hear all these stories of the land being taken from Indians and all that be lost, and I, I know that's tough. And he said, but, but I'm Norwegian. My family didn't take anything from your people. And I didn't have anything to do with that. <laughs> so there's this, this sense of, of guiltlessness that we don't need to hear those stories, but we do. We need to tell those stories. There are folks that need to understand that there was a cost for what exists today. The freedoms that we have as we honored our veterans. Uh, you know, so often uh, at every funeral when I see one of them dressed blues, I tell them thank you. Uh, I do what I do, and I'm, I'm, I haven't allowed the freedom to, to preach the word of God because people like you are willing to maintain and protect that freedom around the world. And so I'm very thankful for our veterans, and I think it was quite an honorable thing today to recognize them. So thank you all for doing that and, and our leadership for commencing that. Uh, but along with that, our stories need to be told. We need to have... Uh, someone recognize and understand that, that what exists today and the freedoms that you have today and the land that we enjoy today and the resources that we enjoy today came at a cost. Yes. And uh, that, that cost was for many of our Native people who sacrificed, who gave, who went without, whose stories have never been told. Mm -hmm. And so while we look forward to telling them, I say that with a kind of grain of salt because they're not easy to tell as from Dallin and, and from uh, uh, Ken that, uh, and many others to be told yet. Uh, that those stories do need to be told. And as we listen to them, our heart breaks with you. And uh, we pray for those many families that were affected in what we have today because of what you went through. And we're thankful for all of that and for all of you. Uh, I'm a sinner also, saved by grace. God bless you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if I had been thinking, I would have brought a visual aid. I would have brought dominoes. <laughs> the, uh, Pizza? The, yes. <laughs> the dominoes start with the doctrine of discovery. 
The next thing is the age of exploration. The next thing is the age of conquest. The next thing is the boarding schools. And the final thing is the age of suicides. And all of those dominoes set the suicides in motion. Bill is here today with uh, his ministry that he carries, Carry the Cause. And Bill, we'd just like for you to wrap this all up and give us a chance to kind of talk about it all together. Maybe one big talking circle, maybe just wander around. Bill, you've come from, let's see, 32,385 miles away. Uh, or Palmer, Alaska, maybe. Wow. maybe that's yes. <laughs> Come on, Bill. Palmer, Alaska, so I gave you my best Klinget introduction, and lucky for you today, I came in backwards. <laughs> yeah, I see you're laughing, bro. So you know, <laughs> see, if I came in forwards, you'd all be in trouble. Uh, 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 when we come in to a place to show peace, when we come into a place to show honor, we come in backwards. Because usually, uh, you know, if I was prepared, if I knew Larry was going to call on me this afternoon, I probably would have been wearing my button vest or button robe. And on the back, we would have our clan. Because we show who we are. Our, uh, our homes, our knit homes were like, uh, they're these long cedar houses with one entrance and a little bitty door. So if you came in the door the wrong way, <laughs> Everyone in the house would get you. Yeah, you can't sneak up on a chlinget. Right? So we would always come into a place backwards to show, show who we are. Like, hey, I'm your friend. I'm Eagle. I said, I'm young AD. I'm Eagle Wolf. And I gave my name, my, my uh, Lakota name, Wakanya Hentopi. Now Wakanya Konka. I was gifted that. Sacred Sound of Thunder, I gave you my Chunget name, Chigan, and that strong warrior. But uh, I am so honored and thankful to be here with you in Chickahominy land. And uh, it's just amazing to be back here. And, and I want to be careful and honorable in what I say, but I want to be very clear, too. And, uh, you know, I don't have a, a, a real boarding story, boarding school story. But I live after that, the result of it. And uh, so I'm going to give you like the really quick, um, well, I mean, being here, it kind of reminds me of school, though. <laughs> you know? Doesn't it just kind of, you have the chairs all facing up here, you know, and then you have the teacher. <laughs> you know, you guys, you know, you have reservations. You know, in Canada, you have reserves, and in Alaska, we have villages. But it does remind me of schools because, you know, we all learned our ABCs, right? Yeah. And our vowel sounds. Yeah. What are our vowel sounds? A, E, I, O, U. Sometimes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> My village, we learned our vowel sounds, too. It goes like this. E, I, O, U, eh? <laughs> Why? <laughs> After the boarding schools and all the hurt and the pain and the shame that it's brought, you know, we, we're trying to, I think we are answering this question, why? But I pray that you will have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying today because we need to answer 
what? What do we do now? In Alaska, we have the highest rate of suicides, three, four times the national average. We still have four boarding schools in Alaska because uh, the education system is, uh, is still based on the old way. And so we're still trying to learn how to be who we've been created to be. I was given away, so here's my story, my two minute story when I was four years old, my uncles used to bet whether I take it, whether I could take a hit off a marijuana joint, they used to bet whether I could take shots of tequila, seven years old, uh, my parents divorced, eight years old, I was already addicted to marijuana, uh, my mother was my dealer, my supplier, my home was a party house from the beginning of the day to the ending of the evening, no party that you would ever want to go to. I was given away because my home was such a mess, my mom didn't know what to do, with an Indian boy. See, I had half sisters, and I was the only Indian. She gave me away to a stranger who abused me about every way you could think of, physically, sexually, mentally, and verbally. He used to get chased around the house for putting toothpaste in the wrong place on the bathroom sink. Get chased around the house with a gun. So I lived my life in fear for so many years. And so in a sense, I was thinking about this. It's like I kind of lived this boarding school in a modern era in a different way. You know, as some people, our friends like uh, Richard Twist would say, you know, yeah, this whole colonization idea is like, you know, it's like can be explained in this one statement. Uh, 400 years of bad haircuts, right? <laughs> we forgot as a people, not forgotten, it was stolen from us, but you know, in this whole mess, uh, our identity was stripped, taken away. And you've heard many of these stories. Now, I don't want to go into a big, long thing. I'm supposed to kind of culminate this thing and wrap it up. And, you know, I, I you know, but forget this, you know. It's like, you know, in my pain and in my shame, I used to talk to people like this oh, yeah. through the parts of my hair because I was so full of pain and shame. And once I found and had that encounter with Creator, and his son, Jesus. That's when my life changed. Like, if you know the Bible, it's like uh, Josiah. When King Josiah, age eight, Shaphan uh, brought the, the, the priest to read the sacred scrolls to him, King Josiah, at eight, eight years old. And he reads in 500 years before he was even born, he hears his name in the word of God. And this mama's boy, you know, King, King Josiah, you know, he probably likes milk and cookies and did everything <laughs> mom said, right? Eight years old, but he hears his name in the word, in the scrolls, in the book of life. And he goes from this mama's boy to a roaring lion and becomes a reformer of the land. That's what this message should do to us. And I've heard it, it spoken in different ways. I'm going to share a statement that, that's really, um, and, and I really like, you know, the one idea of every child matters. But as I mentioned, I'm from Alaska where we're seeing um, suicide just destroy families. The reason, a uh, big reason why we're seeing that hurt, that pain, and that shame, because there were kids, there are thousands of kids like me. When I go to the villages of Alaska and I share my story, I can't tell you how many kids will come up to me and say, Bill, your story is my story. When I finally started to get free from my hurt, my pain, and my shame, I cried out to Creator, I said, I can't do anything. I'm a bumbling, fumbling idiot. You know, I can play drums. Man, I can make this podium. Right, I can make this thing. I can, I can make music out of, you know, anything that you beat, you know? <laughs> I went to school on a full tuition scholarship, you know, uh, playing classical and jazz percussion, but you know, but that was BC, before I had that encounter with Creator, before I had an encounter with God. But once you got a hold of me, 
that something changed. I went from that, talking through the parts of my hair, being willing to risk it all. And like I said, I shared my story, and I, you know, hundreds, even thousands of students will say, your story is my story. So here's the scripture, and here's, I believe, part of our mandate in this time and in this season. You know, the disciples are asking Jesus what to do next. One has his father pass away. Jesus says in Luke 9, he says, let the dead bury the dead. Go about the kingdom. That's a dangerous statement to say right now, right? This is what I know. Is that young people and elders from 2 to 92 are killing themselves because they've lost their identity. They've lost who they are and the beauty of who they are. And I believe that it is time for us to share hope with every man, woman, boy, and girl in every reserve, reservation, village, town, city in North America. We can change this epidemic. We had a pandemic of COVID, but we have an epidemic of depression and suicide among our people. But guess what? You are the hope. You carry the cure. You are the answer to those problems. It also reminds me of Humpty Dumpty, this problem that we're in. <laughs> right? <laughs> you, know the, you know the nursery rhyme, right? Help me out here. Humpty Dumpty, stand on the ball. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. We live in a Humpty Dumpty world. It's messed up. It's broken. The only one that can put together our broken world and messed up land is the one who created us. Without mistake, each and every one of us. Not an accident, not a whoops, not a loser, <laughs> not one. You're beautiful, fearfully, wonderfully created in a unique awesome way your drumming your dancing your language your culture all those things are the fingerprint of god on you and on us look at your thumb for a moment just do this here look at your thumb yeah the thumbprint on that thumb is one of a kind that's a message to you and i so i'm on a mandate to end this epidemic of suicide so I go into schools with a Committed to Life program, giving young and old reasons to live. And I believe we're seeing a change. Um, you know, but a big part of that is carrying it in, in our native way. You know, I was given away when I was young, lost my whole nativeness. Now, I need to tell you the truth, I'm clinked and Filipino. I'm a Kinkapino. <laughs> I knew nothing because I was given away. I knew nothing about my my Klinkit side for many years. And I was told that, uh, that all natives were drunks, losers, and they, they were not going to amount to anything. But when I had a real look into the eyes of the Creator, He said, Bill, I love you as a Filipino and a Klingon. When I had that revelation, my life changed. There are thousands and thousands of people all across North America that are waiting for the good news. Someone say good news. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Say good news. Good, good news. news. Yeah, they're waiting for the good news to be expressed in that way. Yeah. That's the mission of Carry the Cure. Christ in us is the hope of glory. 
And uh, so I did something else here. In our land, I just wanted to uh, do this. And this can be kind of a plug, but this is kind of also uh, you know, a support. Uh, during COVID, uh, I did what a lot of other people did. I wrote a book. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. But it was because my heart was broken for our native people in the land. And there was this epidemic of, of suicide plaguing our people. And I had tribal administrators calling me and say, Bill, we need you. We need Carry the Cure to come to our villages because we have lost more people to suicide, yeah. drugs and alcohol, and other things than COVID. So they, they've set aside all their COVID mandates. And we were the first groups into these villages by the invitation of tribal administration. So we took hope. We took some practical tools, clinical, cultural, and spiritual tools. Man, how many of you know you're like a vehicle, man? You're going on a journey, right? In life, you are going on a journey, and you may be like, you know, you know, like, uh, like Jordan, man, he was like, you know, he loved the vehicles, man. He'd always gift me Hot Wheels and stuff like that. He loved vehicles, but that vehicle, it, you can, you're all customized, man. You got that that cool beaded necklace, man. You got that bright shirt, you know, and look, you know, you got the bolo tie, and I got the eagle. <laughs> so, so we have like our custom pieces on the vehicle, you know. But if you have, if, you know, you have four wheels to get you down the road. But you know, if one of those wheels were to go out, man, you are in trouble, right? Yeah. Yeah. So in this book, I have like this uh, one part of it where I talk about how we. It's called check your tires and keep your seatbelts on. Talking about balance in life. And see, we, those four different wheels, help our vehicle, different areas of our life, help that vehicle to get to our journey in a good way. Huh? And so those wheels, those four different areas, are spiritual, relational, physical, and emotional. So we need all those things in balance to have a good journey. Uh, I created this book because of that epidemic that I'm talking about in our land. Um, also, in our land, can you believe this? In Alaska, there's a beautiful, beautiful mountain. Now, I'm a hiker. I'm crazy about hiking. Uh, some people see mountains and they go, man, I want to conquer that mountain. I see a mountain and I, I go, I want to take my drum on the top of that mountain. And I want to dance my prayers for the healing of my people, for the brokenness. And I realized just a few years ago that there's a mountain in Anchorage, Alaska called Suicide Peaks. Suicide Peaks. And I'm thinking, no. Uh uh. Not in my land. Not here. I have seen way too many friends and family members, and I almost took myself out many times. No, there's not going to be a mountain in Alaska called suicide. So I've been on a mission to change this name. So you can see the mountains on the back of my shirt. There's a beautiful lake there. Beautiful lake called Rabbit Lake, and these two beautiful mountains tower over it. They're currently called Suicide Peaks, but I'm proposing Yuyongchech. Yuyongchech is the Denina, the Athabascan name for heaven's breath. So it's going before the USBGN, the United States Board of Geographical Names. Probably this uh, November, it looks like they will vote on it. And uh, there's a, anyway, kind of a, so. This is what I did. I'm sorry. I'm trying to get. There. I'm trying to land this plane. You know? <laughs> oh my gosh! You know, when you've been flying from Alaska to Virginia, you know, it's kind of it's kind of hard to get the wheels on the ground. <laughs> gosh, guys. Um, <laughs> what he said. Yeah, yeah. What he said. <laughs>
so so this this mountain, you know, it, it is a problem. So we decided we're going to change the name of the mountain. And uh, you know, uh, I, I also went up this mountain with a bunch of people. Like, how many of you guys watched the uh, American Ninja Warriors before on NBC? Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a couple of Alaskans that have been uh, uh, Ninja Warriors. Yeah. One is Nick Hansen, a good friend of ours, which I actually led to the Lord, you oh, know, wow. in Unicleet. Uh, he's called the Eskimo Ninja. And then there's another yeah. uh, uh, Jerry D. Ariel. Um, but I asked some friends to go up with me to Suicide Peaks, to go up there, and we did a couple of ceremonies, and we played the drum. And native and non-native, we all danced our prayers. We declared scripture, and we took communion. So this name will change. But as we came down the mountain, uh, we did this video called Rise Above It in the book, too. Now, as we came down, each one of those hikers shared what they learned to rise above. One would say, hey, I learned to rise above alcoholism. I learned to rise above physical and emotional abuse. Another, I learned to rise above bullying. I learned to rise above, and it went on and on with all 12 hikers. And so that inspired this book called Rise Above It. Each one of us has a mountain that is facing us, that it seems impossible to climb or get around. I'm going to read the back of this, and then, then I, I will really close for the first closing. <laughs> <laughs> right, Larry? Absolutely. OK, so once I knew there was a mountain called Suicide Peak, I knew I had to hike it. I knew I had to dance my prayers on it. I knew we had to conquer it. Looking directly at it, it looked impossible to conquer. But like any challenging mountain of a problem, if you step back, you could find a way to rise above it. This book is not a religious book. This book is created to give you, teachers, and anybody some practical, clinical, cultural, educational, spiritual tools but it's, it's created for the public places. It's created for the teachers. There are 10 lessons based on those 10 different things that each one of the hikers said that they learned how to rise above. Our response to the pain and the shame and the hurt of the past needs to be put into action. Yes. We have to tell our stories. We have to build understanding. We need to know the truth. But the truth sets us free. The truth could give us courage to face the mountain. I believe that this mountain of suicide represents a principality in our land. And it needs to come down. It's a native land. It's not just in Alaska. But I think, you know, it represents, since we're the highest state furthest north, it represents a high place that needs to come down. I would encourage you, I only have 20 of these. <laughs> you can go online. But seriously, I would encourage you to get it to anyone who works in the public school system. I'm, I'm a certified teacher, secondary education. Uh, but I'm also a licensed, licensed and ordained minister. Oh. But uh, I, with our program, Carry the Cure, we invade the secular places for the glory of God. Mm -hmm. We have to learn we can't hang signs on the door of a church yep. and expect to make change. Oh. You know, we need to go where the people are at. In the schools, oh. in the businesses, in our tribal halls. This is created for that purpose. So check it out. There are 20 of them. If, if I run out, then you can order online. It's available <laughs> on Amazon Kindle, too. But really, this is a tool to help people share hope. There has never, ever 
ever, ever been a better time than now to share hope. Amen. We have this season, this window, and I believe that it's, it's like by orchestration of Creator, all these problems, Black Lives Matters, every child matters, this matters, that matter, I matter, you matter. What is that doing? It's creating tension. Yes. But there's one solution, but it needs to be carried in the right way. Father, I pray right now that we would have ears to hear and eyes to see. Ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying in this time, in this season, how to reverse the curse in our lands. How to see our native people shine like stars, just as they were created to be. To see a move of unity among black, white, polka dotted, and striped. To see each child honor each other, but above all, honor you. I pray that we would rise up with hope that doesn't disappoint so that we can see an end to the epidemic of depression, suicide, and other abuses which are holding us back. I pray this all in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.